resume recording. Um, so um, instead of, if you end up watching um, a recording instead of a live session, that's perfectly fine. Um, just make sure that you fill out the attendance form and say it's a makeup class and tell me whatever date you did the makeup class for so I can fix the attendance um, or whatever date you did the makeup. I think that made sense. Um, so I mentioned it's 83 degrees and a little hot. Um, so we will we will make this work. Um, oh, I appreciate you for asking. I do feel better. Um, I found I mostly don't sneeze as long as I'm not in my own home. So I have been visiting a lot of friends lately so that I can stop sneezing so much. Um, so for tonight, um, we're going to be doing an overview on the social emotional needs of our twice exceptional learners. But before we start in our before we start in on our new topic, um, I did want to give people a chance to ask any questions that may have come up. Um, if you've done any of the readings, if you've had a chance to um, talk to anybody, if you had a chance to talk to me, um, you're welcome to throw it in the chat or you can come off mute and share. And um, I just, I, I like to be able to answer questions for folks um, that they might not have had a chance to, to ask. I have a question. Uh -huh. um, so I teach kindergarten and I know obviously we don't um, qualify students as gifted until third grade. So being that children are not identified yet, but you kind of, when you know, you know, like I I'm just curious how we can service those kids. And Absolutely. So, and, and this is again, one of those situations where what the research and literature say is at odds with the policy in MCPS in the state. And it's not a negative at odds, it's just they don't match each other. Um, so the state of Maryland says that we have to identify students as gifted by at least thir third grade. We identify at the end of second grade. So technically the first time you all see it will be the beginning of third grade. And then we have to identify multiple times after that. Um, other counties do identify kindergarten in first grade. But as you said, you know, we do have scores um, and we have students who we know are gifted prior to that. So usually what I tell teams to say is that we, um, that we suspect a student is gifted or we believe a student is, um, has a twice exceptional profile and that we will continue to monitor those areas if we're writing it into a 504 or an IEP. Um, if we're just talking person to person, then we would say they show a lot of those advanced learning traits and behaviors, and we speak to what it is that the students can do and what the students need. Um, I had a kindergartner this year who, he was not available very well for the psych, but I mean, when he did the Whitcock Johnson, I believe he scored like a 150 on some of the reading sections, but he's five. So, you know, obviously not the student that we're going to identify as gifted, but we still had to address his, his abilities and his needs. Um, he was doing ratio work. He was able to, 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 he didn't know the academic language, but he could explain the difference between decimals and fractions and ratios. I mean, he, he had the skills. Can't really write gifted on the IEP, but obviously we're addressing that part of it. Um, and, and that really is where it is. It's like, a label is only as good as the conversation around it. So when we write it into our IEPs, if we have it, you know, in either the impact statement or we have the um, the cognitive section, or if we have the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Any of the present levels really, we can incorporate where our students' strengths are and where their needs are um, so that we can highlight it. So Nancy, you are correct. When we start our the PTD or the primary talent development lessons, um, we do start those kind of, those portfolios in kindergarten. So if you are in, in a Title I elementary school, you have a position called a primary talent development coach. And the job of the coach is to do um, talent development lessons and also to create portfolios for students 
so that we can watch their development over time. Um, these can be done in any school, but we fund and pay for it for Title I elementary schools. Um, and again, that gives us that longevity, right? So it's not just a single data point of like, you did really awesome on this one project, but rather it gives us the, um, you have multiple years of data and evidence to show student growth. Currently, we don't use that as part of the actual GTA identification. And um, we're aware of that. So as we go through our new iteration of GT identification and you know we review policy and we try and do updates every year, um, knowing that those primary talent development portfolios are not as incorporated as they used to be is something that is definitely known. And we want to do a better job of incorporating that information when we identify students as gifted specifically at the end of second grade. Um, the other thing that I know that we can sometimes caution about is the using the WISP, WISPy versus the WISC. So basically they're all the Weschler intelligence, but one is the primary, the WISC is the for children, and then the, it doesn't have as nice of a sound, I forget exactly how we say it, but there's one for adults as well. So once a student turns from 15 and 11 months to 16, we actually use the adult intelligence scale, which measures slightly differently. Um, and the reason it's important is because when because everything is normed based on age, it's a lot easier to have higher scores if you are above average on the WISPY. And so we do want to be careful about over identifying kids when they're too young. I mean, that said, you know, when you get kids who have 130s, 140s, those are not necessarily over representation. It's really those kids who fall in the 100s, 110s, 120s. Um, that we definitely want to keep an eye on and, and screen um, a second time when they get a little bit older and we're able to use things like the WISC so that it's they've had more time to have instruction and also so that their peer group is because they're all measured on age base. So if we have a student who is extremely advanced when we are in kindergarten, they might not have as many peers to create some of those bell curves. And so as they get older, that bell curve norming group gets larger and we can make a better, um, we get a better idea of what it is that they are capable of doing. So that's a lot of information, but I, I think, you know, the core of that is that's why we assess frequent, not test, but assess frequently. We review frequently and we use multiple data points to identify our kids as gifted, to identify where their strengths are, and to make sure that the instruction matches what their needs are. Um, yes, um, Andrea, I will take time at the very end to go over some case examples, uh, case study examples, mostly because it, it will take me a minute to pull them up. Um, and so if people have questions, we can at the end talk about some case study ideas and I can show you some examples of what teachers have done or other people have done. Um, So there have been a bunch of different, there's been a bunch of different messages about resource classes in secondary. Um, on the one side, there was a whole piece about our resource classes, um, opening them up so they're not just self-contained and only for, um, for special education students. And so there was a push for a while for us to have broader resource classes and have more students involved. Um, some schools went overboard in that so that they have no self-contained resource classes. Other schools have remained completely self-contained, so there's no students with no general education students, get students with 504s in there. Um, some schools are kind of in the middle and they're kind of balancing around like what the, what the sweet spot's going to look like. And so they are doing some self-contained special education only, and they are doing some um, not self-contained, so a mix of special education and general education students. As far as the um, twice exceptional resource class goes, we do have some schools. So any of the schools that have my program, so Clemente, North Bethesda, Odessa Shannon, Watkins Mill, Walter Johnson, and Northwood are my, my six secondary schools that have twice exceptional programs. In our schools, we do have a dedicated resource class that is taught by our twice exceptional case managers and is exclusive to just twice exceptional students. So those are just our students with IEPs who are in the program. We always, you know, there's always a 
grace-based student, you know, sometimes we have from either gen ed or from um, regular special ed who needs our extra support. But basically our classes are, are self-contained with just our program students. We also have schools like um, Magruder, Blair, Springbrook, I think. I know there's somewhere between seven and nine schools and I'm not gonna remember all of them, um, who have enough twice exceptional students and usually that's because of their magnet programs. They have enough twice exceptional students that they have a section of special education students who are in mostly advanced classes who really only need support around executive functioning, self-management, um, and they don't need the academic pre-teaching, reteaching that we tend to primarily do in, um, that they tend to primarily do in a regular resource class. And so um, we're really also seeing this pop up a lot in IB classes um, or schools that have IB programs where they are doing resource classes that are primarily IB students or AP IB students. Um, and then the other piece is for schools who have, um, well, all of our high schools have AP classes, but we do know that one of the biggest challenges for students who, um, for students who are taking AP classes for the first time or who are going maybe mostly from on-level classes to an AP class, the biggest piece that defines whether or not those students are successful is the support that they get. And not all students just naturally know what to do when you get into a class, like an AP class. And so um, there are schools out there who do first year AP resource classes where they are basically taking kids who it's their first time taking AP regardless of any services and they give them an extra support class so they can coach them through that ability to access um, those advanced level courses. And those are not tied to any, like I said, no services. It doesn't matter if there's 504 IEP or nothing, it's open to students who need that extra support in an advanced class. Um, I just got a private message. So I know I said it last week and I'm gonna say it again. Um, Families always come first. If you have a family emergency, if something comes up with you, um, go. I record my, my classes for a reason. Um, so please take care of your families. And, you know, I appreciate it when you guys shoot me an email and check in to let me know if you had to miss a class or are going to miss a class. Um, but families absolutely come first. I'm not going to say anything so magical and so timely that you have to know it right in the second. So while the responsibility is to attend the class, you guys need to do what you need to do, especially in the summertime, because nothing ever goes well when you have free time, right? You're not allowed to take a break. Um, so I hope that answered that question. And I'm always happy to answer questions as you guys throw them into the chat. Um, so like I said, we're gonna talk first about um, social emotional needs tonight. And I do have a couple different presentations I'm going to pull together. Some of them you might see in the course. So if you click on a video and it's me talking about the same presentation, you don't have to watch that video. Um, some of it is I've restructured where things fall in my, my, um, where things fall within, within the, um, course itself. And so, you might we might come upon a couple of these things again, but I just kind of want to start us with the um, with a presentation I have that is called addressing the social emotional needs of twice exceptional kids. So this is um, as I think I've shared with everyone before. This is a presentation that I have done. Chat share screen. So there's generally one or two things that are not as uh, up to date as I would love them to be, but they are, I would say up to date enough that they're accurate. So sorry, I'm also changing the timer feature on this because um, if I have a timer running, it's gonna drive me nuts. And yes, we will also take a break at, at eight o'clock like we did last time, because um, if nothing else, I'm going to go downstairs in air conditioning for a few minutes and just breathe a little bit. Um, so our twice exceptional um, social emotional needs. So this presentation I actually first developed um, literally pre-pandemic. I presented it for the first time on March 6, 2020, and um, 
didn't do a lot of follow-up as you can imagine, but really the purpose of this presentation was um, I was at, um, I had just come from the William & Mary Twice Exceptional Conference and I was actually presenting this to the state of Maryland um, for our Maryland Educators of Gifted Students um, Parent Night. And the purpose of it was, we had a lot of introductory twice exceptional. Like once you get in, you know, you go a lot through like a lot of introductory and we wanted something that was a little bit next level, but still basic enough for people who were not overly familiar with twice exceptional kids to really start to get the twice exceptional flavor, if you will. Um, and so that was kind of just the impetus of the presentation. So I'm gonna skip this since we talked about it last week. And the 102 is really talking about what is the social emotional profile, how do we build capacity of our staff, and then how do we implement instruction and best practices. So, so the first, the most important part, I think, is actually kind of going over a little bit of our history, and this is going to be very recent history. Um, I don't think I mentioned it clearly last week, but the, um, the twice exceptional program officially has been an MCPS since 1984. So as of next year, it will be, it hurts my heart a little bit when I say these things, it'll be 40 years old. Um, obviously things have changed in the last 40 years. Um, but when it comes to that social emotional piece, we've had a lot of um, changes, I would say, and a lot of noticeable changes really in the last 10-ish years. And just like social emotional became more of a thing, if you will, in general education, um, it became more of a thing in twice exceptional as well. And yes, I will share presentations. You might need to remind me, um, but usually I have them posted in the course. And if I don't, shoot me a reminder, please. Um, so I came to my position in 2018. I started July 1 of 18. And I had been a case manager in our program since 2014. I had just, just finished my gifted certification. Um, and so I was right there at that cuspy time when we really started talking more about social emotional. So one of the things that I decided to do um, from the start was to come in and look at, um, to start trying, trying to collect as much data as we could on what Twice Exceptional looks like. Would you please get me more water? Thank you. I like having a delivery service. Um, the next thing is, and I, and I know, and I'm, if I had a counselor on here, I'm sure they could tell you how much longer they've been around, but CASEL is the, um, is, is a organization which talks about social emotional learning and they specifically had nationally recognized SEL guidelines. I don't know exactly when they um, became known, but I do know that they, we started giving them a lot more attention back in 2018, 19. We've, so we're looking at trend data within our schools, and then we also wanted to look at curriculum options because for the first time we were really discussing social emotional needs as a curriculum and not just as IEP goals or, you know, kind of bits and pieces. Um, so we pulled together a cross office team that had people from uh, curriculum and instruction, from school support and improvement, special education, um, the OF. OS, FF, that was, that's counseling and psychology. Um, and then leadership from the program, the schools that had specific programs. So we presented our first um, information in the, the summer of 19 in order to um, move this process forward. So, and one of the first things we did was, and, and I, I know I've mentioned this along the way, but we officially became the Twice Exceptional Program 10, day, 10 days ago on July 1st, 2023. Up until then, our program was officially called the, the GTLD or Gifted and Talented Learning Disabilities Program. It has had lots of iterations of names, but it really has been GTLD in some iteration since about 1990. Prior to that, it was the LDGT program, so Learning Disabilities and Gifted. Um, Obviously, we know we want to talk more about strengths and, and where our students' strengths are. We want to put that first. But part of what we were seeing in our two profiles was that GTLD was too broad. 
because what we, when we described a GTLD student, we are really describing a GTSLD student. So a gifted student with a specific learning disability. So those are dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, decoding fluency, uh, processing speed, working memory issues, and executive function challenges. That describes a very specific profile of a gifted student with a disability. What it doesn't describe is the rest of our twice exceptional world. So students who have autism or autism spectrum disorder, students with emotional disabilities, students with um, other health impairments, most like most often, um, most often ADHD, but generally in that category. And then also knowing that their academics and their giftedness is impacted differently if it's a specific learning disability versus some of the other disabilities. These are all cognitive disabilities in some way. They all have cognitive impact, um, including specific learning disabilities. And I think sometimes because we know, you know, that that when we talk about autism and ADHD, we talk a lot about the brain and the specific learning disabilities, we tend to talk more about the academics and the output, but really it is a difference in brain function. Um, and so they're all looking at different ways that the brain is impacted. Um, I also don't know, I'm going to throw this piece in there because it doesn't fit in nicely anywhere, but I personally started gaining more experience with children who were childhood cancer survivors. Um, and we actually have a number of students in our program right now who um, are childhood cancer survivors. And one thing that that we as, as a collective, but also we personally, me, have learned is that when children have early exposure to radiation and chemotherapy, specifically before the age of five, it impacts their brain development. You're not surprised. The part that's interesting is that it impacts the brain development so that the student's disability presents very autism-like. Sometimes it presents ADHD-like, but more often it, it impacts in the executive functioning, in social pragmatics. Um, it just, there's a lot of consistencies but the student does not have autism. But a lot of the strategies from autism practice work, a lot of the strategies from ADHD practice work. So that's why when we talk about that other health impairment, I know in everyone's mind, our first thought is usually other health impairment, ADHD, but there are other pieces. And, and I think that as we have better survivor rates of childhood cancer and our kids are able to access school better, um, my students who have gone through this have been able to access things like um, IIS, and so they're able to keep up with their schoolwork and better able to perform as they are getting older. Um, and I think it's an important piece to just kind of throw into the mix. Um, and it is, regardless of the type of cancer or the type of radiation or the type of chemo, the outcome seems to be very similar in, in how the students present. So at the same time that these changes are going on in my little world of Twice Exceptional, we had some really big changes going on in special education at that time. Um, for a long time, we had an LAD and resource center model, re LAD resource and centers model. So every elementary school had a specialized special education set up. And it meant that if you had academic disabilities, you would go to one school. If you only needed resource support, you didn't stay in your home school, you went to a school. And so right around before and as I came into central office, we really started going in elementary school with a homeschool model um, where we did more inclusion work and had more students being served in their homeschool than we had previously. But part of what that meant was a lot of our kids who are GTLD or GTSLD were better able to be served in their home schools because if you are gifted and your issue is reading, you can get your reading intervention in your home school. We have Orton Gillingham in all of our elementary schools. If you have a math disability, you can get math instruction in your home school. And so what we were finding was the students who were really popping, the students who were standing out to us as needing additional support, it wasn't about giving them just gifted instruction with special education support, but really we started seeing more kids who had other things going on that were um, impeding their ability to access some of our more advanced or enriched curriculum. And the need and the, the approach of our teachers was having to change as well. 
So we saw an increase in social emotional goals, an increase in non-academic service hours. So hours that we were spending working on social emotional executive functioning. Um, we saw a decrease in the SLD as that primary code. And I think another interesting point on this is, I feel like I saw a lot of kids who had an SLD code. And then we talked about a lot about writing, but I know from, from a lot of the work we're doing, sometimes the impact in writing is not the disability, but it's all the other things that are going on, which are then impeding their ability to output in writing, but it's not a writing disability. And I think the ability to differentiate, even if we're using similar strategies to support them, differentiating between what's actually causing the writing disability is important. And also better honing in on the IEP, what the primary disability is, is also very important. Um, so we saw an increase in these. We also saw an increase in disciplinary referrals. Um, that is a rabbit hole, I promise you, I won't go down tonight, um, but I think it's important to know that it's there. Um, we saw a lot of we saw a lot of similar trends in our middle school. The one trend that was very interesting was that the feedback we got that school was too easy, too boring, and a lot of our behavior issues were stemming from a lack of challenge in curriculum. Um, and so that was something I think that was important to note. And high school pretty much mirrors middle school. I didn't do the same type of data collection because I had just come out of four or five years of teaching in the high school. And so I'm just gonna go with, I was confident to say that middle school and high school followed each other on trends. Um, the other thing that happened around the same time is like I said, the whole castle model um, became much better known. Uh, the National Association of Gifted Children, which is my professional organization as a gifted educator, put out new um, standards in 2019 and they had a very strong core social emotional section. And they talk about all of these areas of need um, in the um, in terms of, of uh, what it is that gifted students need in terms of instruction. And then we also had the Be Well 365 come out. I'm not sure if you guys are still using that in schools, but as far as like a framework goes, it's very similar to a lot of the other social emotional frameworks where we talk about um, really it's a, a lot to me like a restorative justice lens where we're talking about repairing relationships, keeping students in the classroom, not looking at everything as a disciplinary problem, but rather a, you know, what can we do to better support ourselves and our students and keep them in the classroom. Um, I do not have an interactive board tonight at this point. Um, I'm actually going to pause this right there and come off of screen share just to see if anybody has any questions. I have a question. Yeah. Who, who teaches all these to the kids, like the self-regulation and uh, who does that? That's my next section. Oh, so okay. We're definitely gonna talk about that. All right, if you do have questions, like I said, feel free to pop up and um, feel free to pop up and ask. There is a question in the chat. Yeah, I see. So that is an excellent question. Um, I personally don't feel well versed enough to talk on that topic specifically. Do we see an impact with those students? I think that that, yes, we we frequently do. I have not had a lot of students who necessarily come from um, those specific situations. And, and I think also when I have had those students come in um, who are in adopted foster situations or not with their, their primary family, um, those needs are often being addressed by other entities. And so, the social emotional component that comes from having that twice exceptional piece um, is not the primary need to be addressed. And so a lot of times it's being addressed through outside therapy or through counseling support and psychologist support. So it's not something I personally deal with directly. Um, 
I have been a part of groups where we have identified that kids have that need and then send them to more appropriate resources. But for the kids that I'm working with and when I'm talking about like this kind of instruction, mostly what it is that we're looking at are kids whose social emotional issues are cropping up because of their giftedness, because of their disability or because of the confluence of the two and the internal struggle that can come from that is in tight. Um, so I don't know why this particular slide is where it is, but we'll talk about it. Because one thing that we decided coming out of all of this, um, all of this information in here was that we were going to need to start doing some direct instruction and some specific instruction in social skills and social emotional learning. It wasn't going to be enough to just talk about it, or like I said, just do some coaching models, but we want to start doing some specific instruction. Cases of students suffered from childhood trauma. Yes, for sure. Um, and it's a really interesting mix because sometimes the childhood traumas are outside the school and sometimes the childhood trauma that we are dealt with are from the kids and their experiences in school. Um, I mean, I, I feel like that was kind of a theme of my essay from last week because I mean, I would, I don't think I'd ever say to myself, oh, I suffered childhood trauma, but then I go, well, I did just write a, you know, thousand word essay on how horrible school was to me and I'm in my forties. So, you know, I, I think we could ascribe some of that to, to the trauma of having teachers tell you, you can't learn, you can't do this, you're not right, you don't belong here. That's traumatic. So yes, we definitely deal with trauma, but I think, again, it's that root cause, what is causing the trauma? For my students who are, you know, have home life trauma, who are in abusive situations or food insecure situations, we want to make sure that they're getting the services and the supports that they need appropriately um, so that we can support that. For students who are suffering from trauma because of classroom experiences, it's a combination of rebuilding trust within the classroom and working on instruction like this. And that's also where I feel like a lot of my job is in terms of teaching and coaching teachers, because I think there's plenty of times, like I know I've been sitting in trainings before and been told something and I'm like, oh, I can identify when I did that. And I feel horrible because it's that moment of like, I know I caused trauma for somebody else. Um, but then the reflective part of that has to be, what can I do moving forward to make it better? So sometimes in these classes, when we're like, when I've read that essay before and I've had teachers tell me, I hear my voice saying that to kids sometimes. And I'm like, I'm glad you recognize it in yourself. I'm glad you own it. And if you still work with that student or know that student, do what you do need to do to repair the relationship. That's what the whole restorative justice process is about. Um, work on repairing that relationship, even if they're not immediately in your classroom right now, because it's going to help them find trust in adults as they move forward within terms of their education. Um, there is a really interesting presentation. I don't subscribe to the school of thought, but I think because of the question, it's fair to say there is a school of thought that says that by nature of having experienced childhood trauma, that the along with being gifted should describe a student as twice exceptional. The specific situation was talking also about post-pandemic. I am very cautious of saying that all the kids who are gifted who went through the pandemic are now twice exceptional. Um, and I know that's not exactly what they were saying in the speak in, in, in the presentation. But I think again, when we talk about this, it's like when we talked yesterday and said, or last week, and we said, you know, is a student who is both deaf and gifted twice exceptional? Not necessarily because neither their giftedness nor their deafness really impacts the other one in a cognitive way. Childhood trauma, I know, can impact in a cognitive way. And so, you know, if it has had that level of impact on their, their person, where it's a true like emotional disability or another health impairment, and it's having an academic impact on their, their educational life, I can absolutely see the argument. But I think sometimes talking about um, childhood trauma in general as part of that twice exceptional piece, I, it doesn't always fit in. And it's 
not necessarily what's being addressed in the social emotional teaching that I do, because again, that has to do with the confluence of the giftedness and disability and their ability to perform in the classroom. Uh, Ashley, I'm just going to go with yes, and we definitely will get back to that. Um, and, and, and that also goes back to some of the discussions that we've had about over-identification and misidentification about sending students into more restrictive programs on, a, on an initial IEP. It should be something that's done rarely, not commonplace. And I feel like it's too commonplace too often right now. Um, so hopefully I'm going to get back to my curriculum because like I said, the slide is just sitting here. These are the curriculum that we looked at at the time. We've also had some others we've considered since then. Um, but yeah, I want to move into what we do in terms of professional development, which is heading more in the direction that Mariella's question was. Um, so initially in that summer when we made the decision to start doing some of that very explicit instruction. The first thing that we did was, of course, our professional learning. So all of the case managers that summer got together. We went through a lot of current articles on social emotional learning around gifted and twice exceptional kids. We actually read the entirety of the CASEL standards and all of the NAGC social emotional standards. We talked a lot about current practices, which Sometimes complaining is cathartic and sometimes it gets some really good conversation out. So it was a really good mix of current practice. What are we doing about this now? And also some cathartic, like this is driving me crazy. Um, and then the other thing we did that I think was important and it was something that we did back in 2014 when I first started as a case manager in the program was that we actually practiced writing IEP present levels and goals infusing that castle language in there. So instead of just talking about, you know, acting out or not behaving, not that my case managers were necessarily writing that, but using some of that very explicit, like, you know, in the area of self-regulation, in the area of peer interactions, in the area of self-management. And we worked really hard to make sure that we were infusing research-based terms into our goals and into eventually our instruction. Um, so our primary text for the elementary school was the Not Just Gifted curriculum. Um, I did an immersive experience to do, lead the instruction in this, um, worked on a pacing guide with my teachers, and we also did sample lessons. I am going to try and show you a sample lesson. And I know I have to do some magic to make this happen. Let's see, new share. No, wait. Instead of trying to be fancy, I am going to turn off that screen share and turn on a different screen share. Oh, there we go. Because otherwise, there we go. Um, so this is the first lesson in the book, The Meaning of Giftedness. One thing that we found um, across the board, this is true a lot of the time is that there's not a lot for twice exceptional. There's gifted, there's special ed, and we're always modifying one or the other. So this was a case of the lessons are great, um, but we definitely had to do some modifications. So in the first one, the meaning of giftedness, um, you know, we laid out what it was the students were doing and we had the guiding questions on here. Um, but the first activity in here was for the kids to sit down and like write a definition of what they thought gifted meant. I don't know if you've ever met twice exceptional third graders, but on the second week of school when we're trying to write a definition, like writing definitions is not something that's gonna happen easily with them. And so instead, um, what we had the students do was we had them do a word splash with the teacher writing on poster paper first. We then had them watch a video, or we had the, we threw a lot of quotes, I like quotes. Um, we had them watch a video talking about the myths and misconceptions about giftedness and what being gifted could really mean. We then talked about common traits and we gave them definitions and words. So giving them a word bank to help create um, their own thinking. And then we had them sort there as a group. And again, they actually did this on paper, not um, on the screen. 
but they actually sorted the different terms into whether they felt it was appropriate to be a thinking term, a feeling term, or a personality term. Um, and then we had them reflect. And so what they ended up writing was a definition for themselves. How am I gifted? And then we turned it into a word cloud. So again, the actual um, lesson from the book was to write a definition, write an essay. My, mm, gifted third graders might do that twice, exceptional third graders have zero interest in it. But they did like the word cloud. And if they didn't want to do it on the computer, some of them actually did create word clouds. And I think one year, the teachers actually brought in like magazines and newspapers and had them cut out words to create a, a word cloud and be a lot more hands on. So a lot of the work that we um, a lot of the work that we end up doing for modification in the curriculum is not making every day an essay writing day and instead turning them into much more hands-on activities. Um, so in that first year, we had 20 minutes a week to do our instruction. And we're talking about the year of uh, 2019 into 2020. So in case you forgot how that year went, um, 20 minutes a week was really good for using our book. When we came back in the pandemic, we suddenly had a lot more time on our hands in some ways. And what we found for our kids was that doing 20 minutes of social emotional instruction every day to start off the day and frame the day went a lot better than our 20 minutes of weekly instruction in person, which was awesome. Except that it was 42 lessons that we had planned to carve out over the course of two and a half years and we finished the entire book in the end of that year. Um, so we kind of were left with what do we do next? Like we could do some modifications and that's where the current work is going to come in. Um, but what we actually did was as a team, because we were sharing the lessons across grade levels, each of my teachers would take a, a week, a month, a theme, and they would work on the lessons for the group. Each teacher could modify it as they wanted to for their particular class, but we had a bank of lessons that we could build off of. Um, and that actually went pretty well overall. The next thing that we did was we, um, now I'm sharing this, I need to make sure there's no student names on here. Excellent. Um, we also worked with our counseling and um, other friends group to do train, training around mindfulness. And this was the year that we actually hired um, the mindfulness coach, the restorative justice coordinator. Um, and he actually had been a teacher at Northwood. So he very much understood our twice exceptional population. And so we started talking very directly about what is mindfulness? How does mindfulness incorporate with twice exceptional? And then what we could do in our classrooms to bring mindfulness to the forefront. Um, and so we went through some training around that. We also had um, our school counselor for the elementary program do a zones of regulation training. We sent our staff to the CPI um, training for the de-escalation protocols and then continue to do more work on de-escalation. So then, uh, Mariella, this brings in your question, how do we get this from our learning to our students? So, um, so in taking all of these things, like I said, we applied it across grade levels. We worked really hard on common language because that way we were able to infuse it throughout our day and then also share it with specials teachers so that it was infused in our elementary program um, across our students' day. And then the work that we did with the secondary teachers meant that as the kids moved up in grade level, they were hearing words and hearing language from our our middle school teachers that they had already heard in elementary school. And even with the interruption of the pandemic, we were still using a lot of those same terms because everything we have is based back in that language around NAGC and CASEL. One of the reasons we, we selected that I'm not just gifted text was because it actually has a crosswalk in the back of where, where in which CASEL standards it meets, where in which NAGC standards it meets, and where in which um, um, common core standards it meets when it comes to a lot, mostly the writing pieces. And so with that crosswalk in there, 
we could establish how it was we were using all the similar language and we were able to make a, a more solid foundation for our students. Um, doing the dedicated instructional time. Um, so we did 15 minutes a day is actually what I have here. Um, and then we also did some embedding in ELA, which is a lot of the work that we're doing this summer. Um, and then the team was was constantly making sure they were on pace so that nobody got ahead of anybody else. So the kids had common language and they could work together so that it wasn't um, overwhelming for our teachers because we knew in adding in the social emotional curriculum, we were adding in more planning and prep time for our teachers. And so providing the deliberate instructional time, but then dividing up the work of actually planning lessons was how we tried to meet everybody's needs for instruction. We talked about that. Um, we checked in mid-year and initially mid-year, it was going a lot slower than we had anticipated. A lot of it was because they found um, they really liked some of the, the extensions on the lessons and the kids like the extensions. And we all know if we go from writing a list to cutting words out of a newspaper and gluing them down, we're, it's gonna take more time. And so we decided that it was a good thing to invest the time in where the kids were interested in this and, and use that to interest to build capacity as well as using um, the curriculum itself. The students were self-reporting on their calming spaces. They were talking about the how it was being embedded in um, ELA a little bit. And then the pandemic hit, so I'm gonna, not gonna lie, we don't have a whole lot of data other than anecdotal after that. Um, I'm looking, none of that is particularly useful to you guys. So we're not gonna talk about the rest of those right now um, because that was our pipe dream of where we wanted this to go. And it, it's it's going. What changed from our, our vision board of where we wanted the instruction to go um, was really shaped by the pandemic because we went through our books so quickly and we had to come up with something else. So luckily, uh, Dr. Mark Hess apparently heard my cry in the night for something because in 2021, he published um, social emotional curriculum for gifted learners, grade three, grade four, and grade five. I now have three texts, one for each grade level um, to use as our foundational text. And so what we're doing this summer, actually, and I think at least one of my, if not two of my people who are doing this project are joining us for class tonight. Um, what we are doing is we are building a pacing guide that matches the ELC curriculum that embeds, it's, it's based on the uh, on the Marquess curriculum, and then it's infused with things from I'm Not Just Gifted and from Jacob's Ladder, um, the Jacob's Ladder Effective Curriculum reading. Um, and if you're not familiar with Jacob's Ladder, I will not give you a crash course on it right now, but we can definitely talk about it at the end. But the purpose of it is that one, as my teachers who are in my classroom are teaching, what they're teaching in SEL is going to have a friend, a partner, a mirror within the ELA period of their day. But then the other piece of it is that we have opportunities that if we're doing a story within the ELA classroom and it has a social emotional lens, they can, they can incorporate that learning together because they're equal, equally matched. Or if they want to say, that's way too many stories today. So we're gonna focus on this story that matches what it is we're talking about in the classroom, and we're going to all use it to support the social emotional learning that the framework is there for the students to do. And then the third piece of it is, I have, as I've said before, I have many more students who are twice exceptional outside of my program than inside my program. And so part of the purpose of this is that any counselor or psychologist can pick the curriculum up and say, what are you guys learning in basically in English right now? And then go into our um, curriculum and whatever they're doing in their lunch bunches, or if they're doing some just pull out instruction, they have something that matches the student's grade level that can be direct instruction that's already laid out for them. Um, so my purpose in it again is about building capacity, but also giving 
handing out lessons to teachers in a meaningful way or handing out um, instruction to teachers and, and counselors in a meaningful way to support the students so that we don't have to spend so much time saying maybe we have to move them like it gives them more hands on and more concrete responses to do within the local school. Now my secondary friends I'm sure you're going to ask that's awesome what's for us I'm getting there. I don't know what I'm not getting there this summer. But I am getting there. Um, so I'm going to stop talking. I am going to um, take a breath and see if you guys have any questions about what we've talked about, which I know, like I said, is elementary focus, but um, any questions on what we've talked about so far? Awesome. Um, so this feels a little bit like a natural break. So rather than cramming things in for the next eight minutes, I am going to, is that a question? Um, I'm going to say let's take our break from now until 7.59, 8 p.m. Um, like I said, I'm going to go down into some air conditioning for a few minutes and put ice in my water glass. And we will be back up here at eight o'clock. Sound good? Excellent. Let me pause. This. Awesome. And um, my, no, thank you. I do not, I, um, I'm waiting for the part to come in. So just pray to the air conditioning part gods that it gets here soon. Um, so when it comes to what we do for our high schoolers, it is not nearly as organized, um, and I totally own that, because there's even less, as little as there is for a gifted social emotional, um, when it comes to curriculum, there is even less for high school. But what we do know is that the two biggest, um, the two biggest things to know about our high schoolers when it comes to their social emotional learning um, and supporting them, especially when we're talking about our high schoolers, is we want to focus on building their leadership skills and we want to fo focus on their self-advocacy skills. Um, surprisingly or not, um, our, our twice exceptional students, no matter how, no matter how confident or smart they are in a subject, do not always have the confidence to advocate for what their needs are. And it's it's for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's because they still kind of have that, if I'm smart, I wouldn't need any help and they just refuse the help. Sometimes it's because they don't know what help it is that they need. You know, that's not where their strength lies. Um, and sometimes it's just part of the growing pains of being teenagers and knowing everything that they don't need help because they know it. Um, and as we all know, you know absolutely everything until you turn about 25 and then you realize that the adults actually know things. Um, so when it comes to our secondary students, what I really focus on is self-advocacy skills and self-advocacy skills in very specific areas. And that's going to depend on the child when I say specific areas, because our questions really are, do they need to advocate for their social emotional needs? Do they need to advocate for calming time? Do they need to advocate for tools, um, whether academic or social emotional? Do they need to advocate for um, su uh, academic support or help? Being very specific and, and um, explicit in teaching them how to advocate for themselves is very important. The model that we tend to use in our secondary, and this is why our resource classes are so different than the general than the general special education resource classes, is that we do an almost 100% coaching model. And what that means is that we are literally sitting down with our students and we are coaching them on what their specific needs are. So we might talk about self-advocacy as a whole, 
but then when I'm working with an individual student, I'm going to pull them over and, you know, okay, we're doing poorly in math. What is it that is blocking our way? What's what's in the way? Is it that we're not remembering to turn things in? Are we not remembering to take things home? Are we not remembering to do the work? Um, is it all of the above? And as we go through our, our coaching questions, we're really finding out usually, well, I've done all the work, but I forgot to turn it in. Or um, I didn't understand what the assignment was and I didn't ask the teacher for it. Or um, I just completely blanked because I'm picturing a specific student. I'm trying to run through his list of why he didn't turn things in in math today. Um, oh, he knew he had a makeup test to do, but he had a makeup test to do in another class. And so instead of telling both teachers he had makeups for both classes, he went, well, that one was first period and this one was fifth period. So I just went ahead and didn't go to the one for fifth period because first period asked first. And then work like that. So really kind of getting in and saying and figuring out what those specific needs are and then helping them come up with a plan to to identify them. And that's where we get into some of the executive functioning pieces. Lauren, you have a question. I was gonna add, I took a class on this um, in the spring on executive functioning and like AAC and special, mm -hmm. and it was super interesting. Cause I mean, I thought it was just primi primarily like my kind of population with like the self-contained students and like the SCB LFI, but it really goes across like the whole spectrum of students. And it's mm -hmm. so interesting how someone can be so smart and so gifted yet struggle to turn in their assignment because there's just so many things. I just found that it was super interesting that it's kind of everybody. I mean, even to myself, I found that I struggle with executive functioning skills. Mm -hmm. um, I am trying to clean my office. Like, this is very nice because I keep the square very nice. You don't want to look that way or that way. I still am finding assignments I haven't turned in from high school. I'm just... I'm friends with some of my teachers on Facebook and I will email them every so often and be like, hey, guess what I found? And they just shake their heads because, you know, after four years with me, they kind of got used to it. Um, but yeah, one of the um, one of the the um, sections that I have for you guys, hopefully if it posted, is on, um, I have one that's on executive functioning is more than just organizing your binder. And then I have another one that's on the hidden curriculum, which is the idea that when we walk into a classroom, we have expectations. If I always write the homework on the board, I expect the kids are going to look at the board when they come in. And our kids might look at the board. They might even see that there's homework written down. But the idea that they're supposed to walk in the room, look at the board, see that there's homework written down, and that that is somehow applicable to their life, not there. Um, I, I know, and I, you guys will probably see the video and go through it, and I apologize, but one of the questions I ask, and in fact, you know, I'll ask it right now, and you can throw it in the chat. How many steps is it in order to put a piece of paper in your binder? Is it two steps? Is it three steps? Is it eight steps? Or is it like 14 plus steps? Or any number in between that you would like? So many steps, I like that. So as a teacher, and especially, <laughs> depends on the day, 100%, that too. Um, so as a teacher, I know in my head, even being executively functionally challenged, in my head, I'm like, put your paper away. Take out your binder and put your paper away. That's two steps. Except when we're talking about a twice exceptional kid, or in some ways, any kid, but especially our kids whose executive functioning is impacted, I have to, well, let's just assume I brought my binder to class. We'll just say, yes, I actually have my binder today. I have to access my binder and I hope I can pull it out of my bag. I have to open my binder and pray to God it doesn't explode on me. Um, so this is like also best case scenario, right? So I've opened my binder, it didn't explode. Now I have to find the section for the class that I'm in and flip to that section. So find a section, flip to the section find the right part of the section, 
because some people like to like super space out with lots of binder tabs. So I have to find the right part. Then I have to open the binder. Is there hole punch? Because if it's not hole punch, we have a whole new series of steps to do. And we're hoping that if you have to go hole punch it, that you come back to your desk and remember to pick up where you left off to put it in. And yes, I have seen kids get lost on the way to the hole puncher and or get lost on the way back from the hole puncher. And I have seen them go hole punch their paper, come back to their desk, put the paper down, close the binder and lose the paper by the end of the period. It's magical. I've been that kid. I can't lie. Open it, put it in, close it, close it properly so it doesn't explode the next time, close the binder, and then put it away in a meaningful place. And depending on what you're, yes, and then you have the sidebar of, why can't you just put this on canvas? Um, except, oh my, I actually have, um, I'll look real quick, actually. Um, so one of our classmates is not here tonight, but she actually did a presentation on executive functioning with Canvas as part of her one of her master's degrees because the steps and the process that it takes, even though it feels like it should be similar, the steps and process that it takes in order to organize things on Canvas and then differently organize things in your Google Drive, similar but different functions. And so the it's not a, it's not a direct transfer of skills. And so using and trying to figure out executive functioning on Canvas is like a whole nother ball game. But then yes, complaining, where is it on Canvas? Why is it on Canvas? Why are you giving me paper, paper, stupid? I'm even gonna put those complaints aside. So what do our kids usually do? They do make it a two-step process. They take the paper and they shove it in their backpack. I don't know where in their backpack. They don't know where in their backpack. But now it's a two-step process like all the other kids had who just took out their binder and put it in the binder. Um, I am very specific when I help write executive functioning goals for twice exceptional kids. And in that, I never say that they are going to learn to use their binder. I always say that they are going to work with an adult to experiment with at least three different organizational systems. And I modify that number based on the kid because some of them do not have the attention span for three systems but they're going to experiment or look into three different organizational systems and determine which is the one that works best for them. That is a big process, even though it sounds, again, it sounds like it's one thing, right? I'm gonna try a couple things and see how it goes. Sometimes trying a couple things can take weeks. Sometimes you don't know that your system doesn't work until it completely blows up in your face or falls on the ground and scatters across the floor. Um, the top three, I would say, or four systems that we use. Number one is folders. Every class gets a folder. Uh, system number two is an accordion folder. And yes, I know we have some kids that we really want them to open that accordion and know where all their papers are. I was pretty happy if they could open the accordion and put the paper in the accordion because we would just find it later. Um, the next system is the binder system, which does work for some kids. The next system is um, the spiral notebook with pockets. I recommend that system as one to try because that is my lifesaver. And um, if you were to look on that side of my office where things are not pretty, I have every single spiral bound notebook with all of my assignments, whether or not I turned them in from 11th grade forward through undergrad because I found a system that worked. The front side is I need it and the back side is for I need it later. My notes are in that section. And if it didn't fit in there, it just simply wasn't important. Or I sometimes glued it in, but more than often than not, I just lost it. So I would write down the important things in the notebook and I would move on. And I have stacks of these from those years. I have nothing prior to 11th grade because prior to 11th grade, I was using a binder, which meant I was using my backpack and my locker. And I have nightmares of like opening my locker and all the papers come out because I was that kid for sure. So stick and stuff is the way our kids really do work best. And so giving them a system that works with that rather than fighting with them to get them to use the binder system or a system that works for you um, is, is one of the biggest keys to success. I had one family, um, I love them dearly. I taught two of their three kids. 
And I remember mom said to me one night, they won't, they just, they keep putting their papers on the kitchen table. And then they spill things on there because at that point the boys were in um, eighth, sixth, and second grade. And they spill, they knock things over, they go, but they will not put them anywhere else. Well, because if they put them anywhere else, they lost them. And I said, Michelle, why don't you get a three tier basket? And each boy gets their own tier and you put it in that spot where they keep putting their papers and see how it goes. It's a $3 experiment. And about a week later, she's like, you are a miracle worker. I'm like, I'm not a miracle worker. I just simply taught you not to tell them to put the stuff somewhere else, put it where it was being successful, but put it in a way that wasn't going to completely fall apart. Um, and, and that's a big key for working with our kids is, is using what they are already doing successfully and make it more manageable. Um, it's why helping them with the stuffing works. It's why helping them sometimes with folders work. In secondary, depending on the level of executive dysfunction, they don't always need every single paper you give them all of the time. Allowing some of the kids to keep um, a folder in the classroom for things they need to access immediately tomorrow, next day, especially if you're on a block schedule, having one spot in the classroom where they can keep their folder so they don't take it home um, is sometimes the miracle that you need. And I learned that from a gen ed teacher and I learned it because um, it was the one class that none of my kids would lose anything in. And I was like, why? And he's like, oh, it's because I don't let them take anything with them. And then if he actually needed them to do stuff in resource, he would bring the folders down to me and they would do the work. And then I would take the folders back. And then he'd probably have to call me and remind me to bring them to him because God knows I wasn't going to remember. But, you know, we're still very good friends. Um, and he had one milk crate in his room. And it had the little hanging folders in each kid who needed it. And he even had some gen ed kids who did that because they just weren't going to keep track of it. But they knew where it was in the classroom. They knew how to access it. And if they needed something that was there, they knew how to get a hold of it. And it, it was a really important thing. Um, the kid I was thinking of earlier, you know, he's such the classic, so smart, um, captain of, of the wrestling team. He could keep track of everybody's scores and statistics and who was doing what and organize their practices. But dear God, did you turn in your homework? Of course you didn't turn in your homework. So just once a week, we would open up his binder and we would just flip page by page and I'd pull out all of his math work. And then I would write him a pass and put it in a folder and he would walk it down to the math teacher. And why we are still friends, I don't know. Like, I, I love her because she was just like, at least he did it. Which is another, I think, important piece just to add on to that is marking work, marking late work down. Now, I don't think it will surprise any of you. I am not a teacher who believes in due dates or deadlines, except for drop dead. I have drop dead deadlines, but I don't, and I will help you come up with individual deadlines or individual mile markers or check-in points. But I'm very rarely a person who's like, everything is due on this date. And that's it. I have to for this class because you want your credit and I want to get paid. So we're a little bit, you know, more strict about it. But at the same time, I also put out there, you know, if there's disabilities that you have, if you need help, if you need whatever, tell me and I will help you work around it. Um, when we mark kids down for turning in their work late, we are grading their behavior and not their knowledge. And so as a teacher, you need to look at your assignment. And it's not that I understand sometimes the work I'm doing right now is the work that I need you to know for tomorrow. But keep in mind, especially with our kids, if they, if they, if they have the knowledge and they're able to participate, then don't mark them down on the assignments because all it does is reinforce that they have an executive functioning disability or they have an inability to keep track of whatever it is they're supposed to keep track of. Our, um, our job as teachers is to help them advocate for what they need, but our job is also to advocate to the teachers, other teachers, how to better support them. Um, and a lot of the strategies that I 
have picked up among those areas, I've actually gotten from a lot of my gen ed peers and colleagues that I've worked with. And um, one of my co-teachers um, absolutely loved working with her. Her first year teaching was my first year in high school. And so we had a lot of different growing pains together, but over, we worked together for four or five years. And one thing we really came to was we, we ended up with two drop deads. We had an interim drop dead and a, um, an interim drop dead and a last day of the quarter drop dead. So if you missed the drop dead date for interims, you could still turn it in for 50% after interims, so anything from the first five and a half weeks after that, after interim week, and we would give them time in class to make up the work. After that, it would be a 50% for that stuff, but then they had the entire rest of the marking period to turn in whatever assignment was left out. And for when we had big assignments due at the end of the quarter, um, we, we didn't completely leave it on their heads, but we would give them the option of which marking period they wanted to turn it in on. So instead of saying, oh, well, it's the last day of the quarter, they didn't turn in, I had to get my grades in, I would exempt them. And so if you didn't have it, you had an X for the end of the marking period, but it was the first grade on your next marking period. And so the incentive was they didn't want to start the next marking period with a poor grade. So they would still do the work and get it done well. And we would just start off the next marking period with that grade. I may have also used that to sometimes look at grades and go, I'm not going to thank you for this really terrible work at the end of the quarter you are going to fix this and give it to me at the beginning of next quarter, or you did amazing and I wanna make sure it boosts your grade this quarter, so I'm gonna keep it where it is. To me, that was important because it was grading them on what they did and not how they functioned as learners or as kids with executive functioning, but I did it with my gen ed kids too, because it allowed them to work on prioritizing and task initiation, and those are all other parts of executive functioning. Um, if I didn't say it already, I don't think I did. Executive functioning, it can be broken down in a number of different ways, but it's generally accepted that there are between 12 and 14 components to executive functioning, depending on which book you read. So my current favorite one is uh, Joyce Cooper Kahn's uh, Late Lost and Unprepared. If you haven't read it, it is a guide to most of our lives. Um, but I'm looking for her list. Oh, she's only got eight in here. Look at that. So I'll read the eight that she has, um, which are inhibition, shifting, emotional control, initiation, working memory, planning and organization, organization materials, and self-monitoring. Um, I read one that was earlier today, and they also had time management in there. So some of those categories you can actually um, good question. I'll wrap back around to that. Um, sometimes um, um, your emotional control can be broken into different categories. Sometimes your initiation can be broken into um, task initiation versus like maintaining your task and going to completion. Adding in goal-oriented results is another way we can break it down. But the important part is executive functioning is all of those pieces. It's not just that organizational piece. And so when we talk about kids who are having trouble getting started, having trouble continuing, having trouble deciding which is more important. We have some kids like you got a 10 point assignment and a two point assignment and they're both overdue. Which one do you do? And the number of times my kids say the two point assignment because I was assigned that first. Yes, sweetheart, you were assigned that first. And I'm glad you know you were assigned it first. However, you know, we need to make sure that we are looking at things like points and, and how that's going to do. And then that goes into that um, being goal-oriented and the, the prioritization. Uh, the author is Joyce Cooper Kahn and Lori Dietzel is the other, I'll show you the book. She also wrote a second book, which I'm not showing you because it's not on my shelf right behind me. Um, and it is um, a, The Teacher's Guide to Executive Functioning, something along those lines. The words teacher and executive functioning are very definitely in the title. Um, I had my teachers read it one summer. 
And a lot of it was on like how we in, can embed executive functioning strategies into the classroom. So what teachers generally will call routines, a lot of times for our kids, the routines are fine, but you need to break them down further and you need to, um, you need to break them down further and you need to be more explicit and you need to tell them a whole lot more time than you're gonna tell anybody else, which might include all the way up to the last day of class. Uh, here's the book again. It's our little friend running down the hallway. Yes, the executive functioning guidebook. That is, I think, the other one. Thank you. Um, I keep looking because I'm pretty sure it's on the shelf in front of me, but I'm just not seeing it right now. Um, so, yeah, so all of this really comes around when we talk about the social emotional profile. Other things to remember are when we talk about things like self-management, that can include self-regulation. So our kids, when they get stressed out and they melt down, it could be because they're having trouble shifting between tasks. It could be because they aren't doing a good job of prioritizing so that they are doing their work, but they're not seeing the fruits of their labor because they're already behind or they're having trouble managing. Um, being able to check yourself and just kind of stop and take a deep breath. That's part of the impulsivity and inhibition issues with the executive functioning piece, which are even more exacerbated if there's something attached to it like ADHD or autism. Um, all of these pieces come into the executive functioning. So when we're talking about the emotional intensities or any of these other pieces, all of it comes rooted back to the executive functioning, the, the ability to make your brain do things and, and keep yourself organized. I was telling somebody else earlier today, one way I have, I, I am a very like metaphor and visually driven person. Um, and there are times like my, my, my brain, I like to run as a stick shift if I need to. Um, and so there are times where I will literally, and you might not actually see me do it because not only I'm on camera, I will sometimes actually stop myself, like break. And then in my head, I shift gears. I actually have to say, no, stop looking at that and start looking at this. And in my head, when I start spitting on things, which I've done a pretty good job of not doing in this class so far, in my brain, what I see is my stick shift going like this. It is just up and down and back and forth and all sorts of little gears. Um, one of the metaphors that we use for talking about twice exceptional kids is it's often like you're stepping on the gas and you're stepping on the brake at the same time. So you're both revving up and you're being slowed down by something. But what we know, if you, for those of you who have ever driven stick shift is what happens if you step on the brakes and the gas at the same time, or you step on the, the clutch and the gas at the same time, you drop your transmission. That would be your meltdown. And so if your gear shifting is out of control and you're stepping on two things at the same time, there's a really good chance that you are going to drop your transmission. And that's what happens with our kids when they hit that overload point and they melt down. So as we're thinking about all of these different pieces of our kids, yes, I like that picture. Thank you, Gina. Um, I think it's those are really important things. Um, the executive functioning workbook for kids. Nope, not that one. I have it, I swear. It's somewhere around here. Um, or I took it back in the office. This is killing me. Half my books are in my office right now at work. Um, yeah, Peg Dawson and Richard, um, I'm going to put his name in the chat. Um, they are also, they are the ones who wrote the Smart Butt series. Um, Richard, um, I have those somewhere. No, they're also on my desk at the office. I was reading it at work today. So they wrote Smart But Scattered, Smart But Scattered for Teens, uh, Smart But Scattered Guide to Success, uh, Smart But Scattered Failure to Launch. That's for your young adults who are still living in your basement. Um, there's a whole series of the, those books and they all talk about how to work with executive functioning 
needs at different levels. So they're all adult or parent driven. So smart but scattered teens and kids um, are definitely for parents and teachers. And then the Smart But Scattered Guide to Success and the Smart But Scattered Failure to Launch are really more for adults and young adults. Um, and there are still things in there that I will pick up and read and go, hmm, maybe I should try that in my household. Um, they're a great series. The Peg Dot, the other, um, the, the student workbooks, um, some of them are really, really helpful. Some of them are a little too much for our kids. But what I like in them is the, um, self-assessments and there's a, and I really like it's kind of like those multiple intelligence inventories but they are really about you know do I tend to wait till the last minute to do something or do I overthink things before I start and they, they ask like some really good questions which helps help the kids understand which parts of executive functioning are a, more of a struggle for them um these should be and if they're not in the course somebody just you know add that in there and remind me and I will make sure that the list goes up. Um, yeah, sorry, see my brain fell out of gear again, didn't it? It's like when we talked, I saw a great meme the other day. It was like, what do you mean your train came off the tracks? You have a train, you have tracks. I have a Roomba. It's going in a direction until it hits something and it just goes a totally different direction. And eventually we cover everything but it takes a minute to get there. If you don't follow, if you uh, don't follow Connor Wolf, is that his name? Connor, now I'm gonna have to look it up. Um, on Facebook, he's great. He has a lot of autism neurodiversity memes out there. Um, oh, we had one question I know I wanted to get back to on the, um, Yes, Pathways to Success is a good website. Um, Gina, you're elementary? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so it is a little bit different in elementary because you guys grade differently than we do in secondary, and I forget that sometimes. Most of the, well, if you're teaching in things like ELC, um, and some of our more project oriented ones, we do tend to hit multiple standards in multiple quarters. So if you've already hit a standard once, you don't necessarily need to hit it a second time. Um, I know it was really important when we designed the ELC curriculum that we hit every single standard, every marking period. So if you are in a place of overwhelm or the kids need more time on one thing or the other, it's okay not to do it in one place in the year because you will come back to it again. That's not always true for all of the, um, it is absolutely possible. We could even start a discussion board for it. Um, it is possible if you are doing something where you have those standards um, that you might not be able to break it up in quite the same way. So that's why I was saying for more for secondary because in secondary, it works a little bit differently. And we do have a lot more flexibility when it comes to grading. Um, secondary people with elementary, they have like very specific standards that they have to do each marking period and they grade on those specific standards. Whereas in secondary, we tend to be more grade-based and, and assignment-based. And so we have that flexibility to go over marking periods. So that's something that not, is not necessarily gonna work in elementary, but I still think there's some flexibility and there's room to do things. And it's also possible if they're really just not getting it done, have them focus on the part that the standard is for that marking period and then let the part that's for not that marking period roll over into the next marking period. I am not the expert on elementary grading though. So um, sometimes my advice is not all on point when it comes, I'm not a big fan of grades if you didn't notice. So I, I'm a big fan. I, like, I, I don't grade on a 100% system. I grade on a five point scale. So that as long as you have made an effort, the lowest score you could ever get from me is a 60% because that's a one out of five. And a zero out of five is a 50%, which means you made some effort and it didn't touch anything on a rubric. Um, and I, and I do that because when we're grading on a 100% scale, there's a huge gap from zero to 50, but every other place it's a 10% increase. So I have to increase 50% to get to an E 
but then you only have to increase another 10% to get to a D and another 10% to get to a C. So if you throw out that grading system and you grade on a five point scale, um, you can mathematically convert your five point scale to a hundred point scale, but you're grading the kids based on proficiency as opposed to based on out of 10. And, that, and when it comes to projects and, and we will talk about this a lot more now, I am spinning onto different topics because we will talk about this more um, when we get to secondary and elementary uh, grading later on. Like I keep thinking later in the, the course, but it's only four weeks. So I think that's, that's module six. Um, I do want to tell you, I added on to the homepage for gifted social emotional development, a 40 minute video that is uh, Kelly Monteroso. So Kelly was a guest speaker for my class last semester. Um, and she specifically did her graduate work on challenges that families face when they have twice exceptional kids. Um, I think it is really important. And that's why I also I share a bunch of my um, family. I, my family is very open, probably too open. But I think one reason it's important for me to be like that is because I think it's really important for teachers to remember that twice being twice exceptional doesn't just affect school and work. Twice exceptional is lifelong. It affects every day from the moment you wake up to if you go to sleep, because a lot of people who are twice exceptional have sleep issues. Um, I slept a full eight hours last night. I'm very proud. It is the first time I have slept eight hours in months. I usually sleep on a five hour cycle and I do better off doing a couple sleep cycles during the day than I do sleeping a full eight hours because that just knocks me out even more. Um, except when I've gone four days without sleep and then I actually needed a good eight hours of sleep. Being twice exceptional affects everything. And so when we have our families of twice exceptional, especially if when it's your child and if you haven't experienced it before, what you see in the classroom is only the tip of, of the twice exceptional iceberg and everything else that's going on at home, it impacts how families have to plan long-term and short-term. It impacts whether you can go out on a particular day or not. It impacts the ability to put the right things in your purse so that when you get to where you're going, you have all the things that you need when you get there. Um, I, I want to go back to being a backpack parent because I can't keep everything I need in a purse. Um, you know, some of the things that you'll see, like somebody pointed out to me the other day, I'm either horribly early or ridiculously on time or ridiculously late for things. And when I'm on time or early for something, it's because I've been sitting here waiting for the time that I decided was the time to leave to get somewhere so I would be there on time. And I've done absolutely nothing other than wait for the clock to get that time so that I can go where I need to be. That is not conducive to a really successful life um, because that means I didn't get a whole lot of stuff done this morning. But if I was working this morning and I got a whole bunch of stuff done, then chances are I'm gonna be really, really late to where it ever is I'm supposed to be going because I have no idea what time it is and I've just been getting done when I need to get done. That that's, can wreak havoc on a life. And when you're trying to manage your kids and this and that, it impacts everything. And then you're adding in the emotional control, you're adding in the goal setting, the prioritizing, all of that impacts. And so when Kelly's, Kelly's research was specifically, I think she interviewed, it was a very small number, it was about seven different families, but they're talking about their experiences as children, as siblings, and as parents of choice exceptional kids, so that you can see kind of the part that we don't often see as, as teachers. Um, I believe it's also one of her first public speaking presentations. So, um, and then I actually do have, if you are that person, uh, I do have her dissertation if you ever wanted to read that. Um, so I'm going to touch on just a couple of things um, and then talk a lot about or answer questions about the case study. Um, Kara, thank you. I will grab that link and put it in the classroom somewhere. I'll figure it out and I'll tell you where I put it. Um, actually, you know what I'm going to do? Let's see if this works. Why? Because if I don't do it, I will forget. 
topic title share document of resources. All right. I just put it as an announcement into the announcements on the class. So you guys will all get an email with the link and hopefully it works. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about the different modules that we have on the um, class site for, for this week. And some of you I think have done them and probably have questions and some of you haven't gotten to them yet and that's okay. Um, because one of the questions I ask at the end is what do you still have more questions about? And so the common ones that I get more questions about, um, the most common one is on the overexcitability piece. So I find overexcitability to be an absolutely fascinating phenomenon. The jury's out on whether or not you can say it's research. There are, there are some people in both gifted and in psychology who will swear that overexcitability is not really a thing, that it, it was an interesting theory that Dabrowski had, um, but it's, it's not a thing. Um, and there are other people who will swear to it like it is a science. I think it's a super interesting theory and whether or not it exists as it's described, I think it's a really good way to classify some of the behaviors that we see and some of the elements that we see um, in gifted kids and kids with disabilities and twice exceptional kids. And the idea of overexcitability is really that frequently when we look, just like people are not gifted always across the board in everything, you can tend to be gifted in some areas and regular or not gifted in other areas. And then with twice exceptional kids, you're also impacted in some areas. Um, when we talk about the overexcitabilities, you tend to be over over into, over sensitive, over involved in different areas. And uh, Dabrowski divides it into five different areas, which if I try and name off the top of my head, I will get wrong. Um, there's, yeah, I'll 100% get it wrong. So I'm just not gonna try and guess it off the top of my head. Um, like I said, I think it's really interesting. I think one, you have to know about it because it comes up in the field all the time and whether or not you subscribe to it, you need to know either why you agree or why you disagree um, with. The research that I'm talking about is on the overexcitabilities page. Um, I don't know if I put up one on why it's not a thing, um, but I definitely have, um, like I said, I think the concept, even if you don't sub subscribe to the theory, the concepts are, are valid. And if you really don't subscribe to the theory, you need to be able to know why. Um, you know, it's like always knowing your enemy's argument. You've got to know why, what the other side is saying. And the other piece of overexcitabilities over is even if you step out of the overexcitabilities element, you still have the emotional intensity. And that is something that we do frequently see. It goes with that asynchronous development that gifted people tend to feel things, think about things, dive into things more deeply and more intensely than other groups. Just like, you know, on the intelligence scales, there's extremes. And on the behavior scales, there's extremes. On the intensity scale, there's extremes. Um, Christine Fonseca does a great job. In fact, Christine Fonseca wrote the book, I'm Not Just Gifted, so the curriculum that we're actually using. Um, she does a lot. Did she write this one too? She did. Um, so we actually, that's another book I reference a lot is Emotional Intensity and Gifted Students. And um, Christine is a former teacher and she's a school psychologist and she really focuses on the social emotional needs of the gifted. Um, there's a good episode. Um, it's on the it's on the course page. It's about 30 minutes um, where she's talking about emotional, um, she's talking about empathetic intensity and how we work around the emotional intelligent children and, and, and working with our kids. Um, and the person who runs the Neurodiversity Podcast, Emily Kreischer Morris, is also a site. Uh, she's, I think she's a psychologist. I know she's a social worker and she's got a lot of background in that social emotional area. Um, and so it's, I think it's a really interesting discussion that the two of them have. I will tell you the theory of positive disintegration. 
do not dive off that bridge unless you want to get into some really abstract thinking. Um, I will tell you that I, I put it up here because I really think it's interesting. And in the world of gifted, um, if you are a school psychologist, you might want to jump off that uh, that ledge there. Um, but I will tell you, even being interested in the subject, I had to read about it multiple times and like take a break and come back to it before I could fully wrap my head around um, the, the positive disintegration theory. So if that's not your bag, just skip right on over that. It will not impact your life in the least. There you go. I knew the, psych the psychomotor intellectual. I forget the other ones, the sensual, imaginational, and emotional. Um, see, if I ask a question, you guys will put it out there to help as well. Um, asynchronous development is pretty easy to follow, and so I don't think I need to talk a whole lot about that. Um, I do know that there's two videos I have on that page that have suddenly been made private, and so I'm trying to find some good replacements. If you do come across um, their personal stories about, they're, usually I pull them from TED Talks, but they were personal stories about people who have dealt with debilitating perfectionism, which is not quite the same thing as OCD, although knowing OCD is, is also an important thing. And in one of my books, they do talk about the need to and why we differentiate between the per, um, hyper perfectionism and OCD, because they're not the same thing. Um, one of the biggest questions I get around perfectionism is always, don't we want the kids to do their best and, and try and make things perfect? And when we send it back, like, you know, go and edit this, the difference between hyper-perfectionism and perfectionism is that perfectionism can be a goal. I really want to make this perfect. I really want to do my best. I want to go back and edit it and turn in a paper that has no errors. That's fine. Hyper-perfectionism is... I can't turn this thing in and I've been working on it 12 hours a day, every single day, and it's three weeks late and I can't turn it in because it's not perfect yet. It's not what I think it should be. It doesn't look like what I want it to. Or I have this idea, but I can't like get the perfect idea. So I can't start the paper. Um, staring at a blank page is one way that, you know, and you're at that blank page to the point that you can't put anything on it because you don't want to make a mistake. Um, I had one student who every time she wrote something, if she didn't feel like it was perfect, she would erase it. And I literally at one point cut all the erasers off of her pencils. And for that particular child, it was the right way to go. It made a difference because when I took away the tool to erase, she had to come up with something else. And what we worked on, because scribbling, she didn't like the way scribbling looked, was we just put a line through it. And I taught her what my teachers back in the 80s used to teach us, which was when you wrote on the lines, you skip the line and you wrote every other line. So if you corrected something, you could cross it out and you had space built in to write your changes. That was enough for her until we got more into typing and, and having things typed. Google Docs is so important for kids who are the hyper-perfectionists who like to delete everything because you can go back into version history and find what they deleted. Um, and and it, it's an important thing to know. So. When, we're, we, when we are, the, the really good book on this is called Letting Go of Perfect. I don't assign 200 page books in my class ever. Um, but if, again, if perfectionism is what you want to really learn more about, there's a good book called Letting Go of Perfect. Um, and then there's another one that's called The Overachievers. And most of the kids in The Overachievers are MCPS students from the late 90s, early 2000s. And it's looking into the lives of like, hyper-perfectionistic students and the stress they go through. And so it's a series of vignettes and, and case studies. And um, there's at least, there's a, I think if I remember, there's a kid from Wooten, Whitman, Richard Montgomery, Churchill, and I don't remember the last one, or we doubled up on another school. Um, but just kind of going through the process of what life looks like for them and how they feel about things, I think it gives some really good insight. And so my high school folks, that's especially one that you might um, might really enjoy. So, so those are the big three. Um, I do have a section on the misdiagnosis and misdiagnosis. Um, and I know my counselors and school psychs, I'm like throwing a lot at you here, but 
unsurprisingly, social emotional is really your realm. When we get into um, classroom instruction, you're going to be pretty tuned out. So it's totally okay to maybe go back and, and spend some more time on this module. Uh, I am not sad if you write things like I'm a school psychologist and I have no idea what you're talking about when it comes to this and just you know focus more on the social emotional. Um, learning about misdiagnosis and misdiagnosis is going to be especially important because our next session is going to be on, on equity. And when we start talking about the gross miss and under identification of twice exceptional black and brown children, understanding the root of the miss and missed diagnosis is really, really important because misdiagnosis is when we you, we have the wrong diagnosis for a kid and missed diagnosis is when we miss it or we we see the gifted and we miss the, the so it goes back to that masking piece. We see the gift, but we don't see the disability. We see the disability, but we don't see the gift or we see a gift and a disability and then we misdiagnosis it as something like an emotional disability when it really is a gifted kid with ADHD who is just bouncing off the walls. Um, and a lot of this really does lead back to um, our discussions around equity, which we will come up to the next time. Um, there is a good article on, um, at some point, I'm, now I'm trying to remember where I put it. There was an, uh, uh, oh, it was last week, I had you guys listen in, in module one on the case for dual diagnosis. So one of the partners to that is the James Webb article on misdiagnosis and dual diagnosis in gifted children. Um, and James Webb is one of, was one of the leaders in the field on that. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2019. So we will not be getting a third edition of his book, but I did talk to some of the other people who wrote it with him. And I do know that they do plan to continue the research in the field and will hopefully publish. The most recent update was published, I think in 19 or 20. And they were planning to, I think, come out with another one in the next couple of years, just because we are learning so much more about um, our student needs. I think that is what I have for our social emotional section. Um, if we have any questions, I'm happy to take them or you can pop them into the chat. And then otherwise, I was going to take the last couple of minutes just to talk about the case study. Or as I said, the very mis um, the very misnamed case study. So while you guys are thinking, I am gonna look up. Um, so firstly, tell me, my friends, have I actually managed to this is something I miss every time. Have I actually pushed this out to you guys on the Canvas course? Does this look familiar? I'm seeing a lot of blank looks. All right. So this would explain why I haven't gotten a ton of questions about it because I did not get this pushed up there. And I will do that um, tomorrow because it's really hot up here right now and I can't think much longer. Um, I am going to be changing some of this because one, it's the summertime and you guys don't necessarily have kids at your disposal. And two, I think I was a little over eager in some of these pieces. So um, yeah, we're gonna just kind of skip down to, when I say options, understand that these are suggestions because I want you to do something that makes sense for your life and makes sense for your job. So some of the examples that I have here are, um, general educators doing the general assessment of classroom activities. And there should be, of course, there should be an example. All right, I will find the example because I'm not on where I thought I was today. Um, basically what this is having you do. Um, can I switch screens? Talk on talk. Uh, oh, it did switch. Excellent. So I shared my screen, not my tab. Um, so what this one is asking you guys to do is to look at a specific lesson. 
sorry, flip that. Look at a specific student, consider a specific student. For those of you who are have kids that you know well or that you have, or even if you had a kid last year, you're probably gonna have a twice exceptional kid next year or in the very near future. So consider who your kid is. Um, and then first you wanna build a student profile. So is this a general education student? Do they have a 504 IEP? Are they, I need to obviously change this to say EML. Um, or if they are recent, I, I don't know if they're still doing recent re release, but I'm gonna keep that on there for now. Um, and are they gifted and or high achieving? And as we've kind of covered, there's a difference. What are their specific needs? Are they kids who need reteaching of topic? Do they need acceleration? And you can have any variety because you're asking what the student's specific needs are. Then we're asking what are their strengths? What are their personal interests? Then part two of that is you wanna take a look at a lesson. And in the first column, you're breaking down what it is you do in general for that class. The adaptations are, what do I need to do to, at, to adapt this very specific lesson for this very specific student? What is it that this person needs? And then because of where their strengths are, how could I change this to speak more to their strengths? Um, what I found and the example that I have, I actually did this in one of my grad classes and I really liked it because what happened was, uh, my co-teacher and I sat down and I said, well, basically I said, Christine, I needed A in this class, so we're going to do this. So we picked one of our kids. This was advanced. Um, this is honors English 10. And we had a student with a severe reading disability and by fallout, a writing disability um, and significant ADHD and a processing speed that was 40 points lower than her verbal comprehension abilities. Um, Love her child. And, and just to make it more fun, her dad was actually my science teacher way back in the day. So I, what goes around comes around, I can promise you. Um, so we sat down and we went through what our students' needs were. And then we talked about how we were going to rework a vocabulary lesson to speak to the needs of a student who couldn't remember the words because we didn't have a word bank and had trouble with like just recalling definitions. And we reworked an entire vocabulary lesson to meet just this one student's needs. And then when we were done with it, my co-teacher said, actually, this is kind of cool. Let's try it with all of them. And as far as I know, she's still doing a lot of what we put in place with that now when she as a teacher. Um, so a lot of times, especially, and we'll get into this more when we talk about UDL later on, which is why this is a culminating piece, because some of the pieces in here we'll talk about as we go. Um, some of the, the, the practice uh, with um, universal design for learning is what's good for some is, um, or what's necessary for some is good for many and should be available to all. And so using that principle, we really kind of developed uh, what it is that we what we're putting together. For my special ed friends, um, this one particularly is focused on um, things that you can do for an IEP. So picking a student and really focusing in as we go through these different topics, you know, do they need executive functioning? Do they need this, do they need that? And what are you learning now to write a better goal for them? Um, so writing a measurable goal and, oh, I have an example of the assignment here, look at that. Um, and then, but I've also in the past year or so, I've had um, some, especially if you're doing any assessments this summer, if you find a twice exceptional kid and you wanna talk about the differences you know, or if you're doing a lot of testing this summer and you wanna sit down with me and do a side-by-side -side of a gifted kids WJ versus an, uh, an average student or even a um, um, student with learning disabilities, Woodcock and see how they kind of have the differences and how we talk about the differences on Woodcock. Um, I'm happy to do that. Um, I've had some who have developed a training for their peers, colleagues in that way they could present at pre-service week or at a department meeting. I am very open to what makes the most sense for you and what's a, the best way for you to express your learning. Um, is this? My, oh, this one is for my, um, counselor psychologist, but I also kind of measure mixed in a bit for my um, 
staff development teachers. And this is really talking about creating either an action plan for executive functioning or some type of social emotional lesson that you can do with students that you work with on a regular basis and how it addresses um, some of these different areas. I also have a um, presentation for school psychologists that needs to be updated. So if you're in the mood, I can give you that and we can update it. Um, staff development teacher, GT liaison, AISTs or content specialists. Um, this is really about de developing resources for your teachers. So in all of these roles, you are in some type of, of teacher leadership role. And so considering what your role is, what resources can you bring to the table for your school, your department, your subject, um, and, and make a kind of one-stop shop of this is what TUI and Gifted is about in my specific area. Uh, I don't think I have any administrators on here, so I'm just going to keep scrolling. Uh, I don't think I have any central office people. If I'm wrong, talk to me. Um, but... I had five central office people last time around, and so I had to develop. And then the last piece is if I have other folks on here, um, I think I said before, I had a speech language pathologist who did an amazing presentation on um, how she was using pragmatic lessons to support a twice exceptional kid with autism. Um, I've had paraeducators create a plan for better understanding how to support twice exceptional kids. You know, I think a lot of times with paras, they're really good at supporting the kids when they are struggling or when they are behind or they need catch up support. Supporting twice exceptional kids in the classroom, they need a very different style of support. And so really talking about how we support them differently. And so I've had paras work on that before. Um, I said last week, if you want to do something in the handbook, please God, that'd be beautiful. I told my boss today, I had several people interested and super excited um, and said, absolutely, we'll make sure to get you um, definitely mentioned in the publication. And if that is something that ends up going over and above what we are doing in the class, we can talk about uh, clock hours for CPD if you're continuing to work on writing with the handbook. And if none of this sounds interesting to you and you want to come up with something else, shoot me an email and let me know what it is that you'd like to do. So this is the this is the culminating activity. So I have a discussion board with each module, and I only have one real activity for the whole course, and that is what I'm putting up here. So I, and I need to post this up there so you guys have kind of an idea. Um, I call it a case study for no good reason other than the previous person who taught the course called it a case study, but I threw out most of the course, so I should change the title of the project. Excuse me, but that really is what it is, is that it's it's more of a problem base, like you're creating a problem or talking about a problem, defining a problem, and then you're coming up with your own solution for it. So um, if I can answer any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the recording because I know people usually prefer